pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Hubberson Select Board will be conducted by remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with the right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via Zoom. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website a comprehensive record of proceedings after the meeting. Okay, thank you. We will um, uh, start with open session. Um, I don't see anybody here for the, oh, there's one attendee now. I didn't, I think somebody just popped on. Uh, so Sanda obviously, or probably is, is uh, here for the uh, the joint meeting with the parks. But Sanda, if you're not, please let us know if you're here for open session and join in. Uh, other, other than Sanda, Ryan, anybody else uh, say anything? Um, I do not have anyone here. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Moving on to announcements. We are at uh, Frozen Assets. Where are we at with that, uh, Katie? It is now uh, February 1st. Yes, today's the deadline to everyone uh, needs to submit their, their guesses. Uh, if you haven't, you can always drop them off if you want to brave the storm and drop them off at the overnight drop box. You can print them offline. The goal of this is to get people into the our little shops that January is always the hardest time of the year to get people in the door for small businesses. So that's the goal of it. Um, and then secondary, obviously, it's a fundraiser for special events. So um, we do ask for a $20 donation per guest form. If you can't afford that right now, that's fine. We'll take whatever donation you're willing to uh, submit. But yeah, guesses are due today. So get them in before I get there. And <laughs> and next week sometime we'll have um, the the ice the outhouse out on the pond uh, as soon as uh, the country hen can work with me with getting the clock and everything out there. And we'll get it dropped out there sometime, hopefully next week. Yeah, this, the weather worked out great for you, right? It yeah. froze up nice. You get yes. a little nervous. Yeah. Well, I was nervous like a month ago. That pond was right. empty. I was right. like, oh, no, there's no water. <laughs> but yeah, it's all good now. All right, sounds good. Thanks for doing that again. Uh, Galanti family, we plan on uh, we plan on placing again. So you did get ours? Yes, yeah. I swung by the offices today to pick up whatever was dropped off over the weekend. Um, I A lot of the businesses are, it's hit and miss whether they're open or not today. So mm -hmm. we'll get them this week sometime yeah. and pick everybody's up so all right sounds good uh okay thanks uh for presentations which is item three next that's the uh, quarter two financial report brian you wanted to uh delve into this a little bit yeah so we did the quarter one brief and we make the this quarterly report from the finance team available to you and the public uh, so I'm not going to go line by line as I do in quarter one but just wanted to provide you some general financial updates I will share this memo. Okay, so on the, the things we're gonna cover are expenses, revenue, capital projects, uh, finance team and what they're up to and financial monitoring, which gives us financial accountability to yourselves, the public and the finance team. So um, this, because of the way it's showing up on Zoom isn't showing color, but the report that's available on the town website and will be uh, sent by social media and email has color indicators for people who want to see where certain things are at. So overall with the operating budget as of June, January, as of December 31st, 2020, the departments have expended 46.88% of appropriated funds. So this doesn't include a big payment to Rutland Regional, but it does include education. So at this pace, departments would be at 93.76% at the end of the year, which would uh, return approximately 593,000 of free cash. So this is well above our expectation at this point. Um, a lot of that is due to um, increased spending that comes in quarter three and quarter four. And like I said, that Rutland Regional. So the number is a little bit misleading, but you should take away from it that our spending is below what we expected, and that's good. That's what we try to do in order to, um, to make sure we're keeping within the constraints of the budget pr provided to us by the town. So in there's no real change in the light items. Of course, you can dig through those. We have 
identified any line item that's over 50% spending and given a quick note on, on why it's there and whether or not we're worried about it. The only ones that we are worried about are police department services, which is primarily vehicle repairs. Uh, this one was heavily expended at the beginning of the year and um, essentially cannot take any additional payment this year or it'll go over funds. However, police spending generally is down and um, our payroll spending is down. So we should be able to cover this internally, even if it does go over. So a concern and something to watch, but not a major concern. And then the other concern for us is fire department services for the same reason. It's uh, vehicle repairs, expensive vehicle repairs on our, our fire vehicles. So that one is so far not, not the point where we're saying that it's definitely gonna go over, but it's something to trend and watch. So just a question, this might be yes. uh, that 116,000 that's not paid. So I just want to make sure I understand that. So um, the 593, I know these numbers are very early and don't mean all that much, but so theoretically half of that or so that my 593 minus 116 would actually be the that's amount. Where, that's where we're under right now. Yes. The, the, okay. So, okay. That was it. Thank you. So put it into context last year, we were about 200,000 under budget. But um, a lot of that is capital expenses too. Yep. So we haven't paid for some of the big capital items. So that'll come off the top of the budget. So okay. we're about where we were last year, if, if you want to put it into simpler terms. Yeah, that's it. Just sort of associating it to something is more than anything uh, what, what I'm looking for. So, okay. Well, that it for the uh, financial report for now? Or? Uh, just a couple of quick things. Revenue. So overall, we're at 47% of revenue expectations. This uh, sounds like it's below 50, but it's not because we haven't done excise tax yet. And excise tax is the, the biggest of our local receipts. We also have fixed a couple local aid um, payments that were behind. So we actually expect to get more local aid than we thought because we got less than we were supposed to last year, which uh, was one of the reasons why we had lower free cash, as I explained last year. So we, we should... Um, we should definitely match revenue minus any pandemic related loss of revenue in the spring, which doesn't look likely at this point. Even the state is predicting that that numbers are going to hold. So on the revenue side, we are we are in good shape, despite the fact that if we were to double the, the revenue right now, we would be minus 568,000 or even with our expenses. So overall, uh, again, in good shape. I, I have no worries to report to you at this time pending any you know, major changes like we saw last spring. And then the report also includes an update on all of our capital projects that we have. These are uh, just updates from where we were in the fall. Most of our projects are moving um, or scheduled, or we know when there'll be a completion date. So this is something people can review if they're interested. And our finance team activities, we set the tax rate, we assisted with the financial forecast and the capital planning, and also completed the FY20 audit, which was presented to you. And then on the financial monitoring side, we're doing very well complying with audit and town policy standards and Department of Revenue best practices. So our cash book is, is reconciled through December 31st as of December 31st. So that's right on the target for where we're supposed to be. In fact, it's a little bit ahead. Payroll withholdings. Um, this is something that was identified in an audit a couple years ago. The auditors are satisfied with where we're at, but we still have some old payroll withholdings that we want to clean up. And this is just to make our books, I don't want to say perfect, but as clean as they could possibly be. And then accounts receivable. The only outstanding issues we have are tax title accounts. And this is a software problem that we're aware of. And it's going to be a major focus of Sandy's uh, in the next, and this is a problem that we've had for a couple of years, not just this year. Um, she's going to really tackle it this spring and bring it up to uh, speed now that we're more comfortable with VADAR and have additional support with them. And then ambulance receivables, the board helped me with this or helped the town with this to get our ambulance receivables on pace. So now we are completely reconciled except for three bills. Um, these will be these are identified and known, so we'll be right on pace with our, our receivables and ambulance, and we are up to date with our abatements, which will be coming to you by biannually as, as you pass as a policy. So then the rest of the report is the detail on the expenses and the revenue for anyone, including yourselves, to review. And that's the brief 
brief summary of the report. Okay, sounds good. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions and otherwise, thanks for the update. Okay, um, sounds good, moving on. So the next item is the joint meeting with parks, which, which we're not quite at seven, we're still 20 minutes away. So we can knock off a few other things here. Um, might as well just go in order. So the first one would be 4B, which is the right of first refusal at nine Morgan Road. Okay, we've we've seen these before, this right of first refusal, and this one's from the, the wind's really bad here. Might lose power. The, um, the, the Laney family on nine Morgan Road is looking to um, look, looking to sell a piece of land as is in your document. I'm gonna show you the exact piece of land. Learning a lesson from our last time. Here is the right of first refusal. So what we're doing here is the, um, the Laney's are taking this out of chapter, which means it's no longer a protected class of land with a different tax rate. They're bringing it out for the purposes of doing something with it. Uh, in this case, selling it. Um, we have the right to buy it first because it was in chapter land. That's just state law. So um, the board is exercising or not its right of first refusal here. And this is the, the lot we're talking about as is in your packet for your review. And I'll let you talk about that as I go check the lights. Hold on one second. Still with me? Yep. yep. All right, a little bit of a nor'easter here, I apologize. So the board can um, act or not on this right of first refusal. Yeah, I don't have any comments. I don't see anything um, in our interest uh, that would get in the way of anything that they have planning here. Um, this is obviously, once again, not new to us. So I don't know if anyone has any issues, but uh, you know, I don't know. What do they need from us at this point? This would be the motion and vote, and then you would sign this document. Can't hear you, um, Pat. Can you hear me, Dan? Yeah. No. I'll Can make. The, I'll make. Huh? Go ahead. I'll make the motion if you can't hear Pat. All right. Okay. I make the motion. The board of selectmen of the town of Hubbardston hereby waives its first refusal option under the prison provisions of General Laws Chapter 618, Section 9, to purchase certain parcels of land located at, that says zero, I don't know if is it, that's supposed to be 10 Nine. Morgan Road. Nine. What is it? Oh, nine. At nine Morgan Road in Hubbardston, described in Addendum A, attached hereto and incorporated herein by reference. I'll second that. Okay, seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll vote. Um, roll call. Dan, yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Katie? Yes. And Pat? Okay, it is unanimous. Um, so I'm going to peel back for one sec before we get to the Country Hen Scholarship. So we have another attendee on, Ed Blanchard. Uh, he had actually called me as you know three minutes into the meeting um couldn't get on uh, ryan i think you might have sent him another link or something okay. that's correct okay so i i you know i know what ed wants to talk about and he missed sort of the open session piece of this so i guess i wanted to ask you ryan um it, it, you know in 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 uh specific to the um um detective's case is there a specific item in the agenda um that you know we should ask ed to wait for or like I've done for every meeting since we started, if there's problems with people getting on during open session, I've always said, we'll just go back and, and allow open session to sort of reopen uh, for situations exactly like this. But didn't, didn't know, Ryan, if you had a specific spot. I was looking at the, the agenda, didn't know what your thoughts were there, if we should just address it now or, or wait. Uh, I did have an update for the board on that as part of my town administrator report. But if 
you want to exercise open session, I don't see why there would be an issue with that. Yeah, I, I'd say we do then because, um, you know, that as far as an update. So, you know, it's up to Ed. He doesn't have to. I know he's on, though. But but if you could um, put Ed as a panelist here and, and we're going to we're going to revert back to um, to open session for a moment and, and ask Ed if he'd if he'd like to um, address the board during open session. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. I don't need to do it during open session if it's a if it's an item that the board is going to uh, uh, do business with later on. I can wait till that time. Okay, if you don't, uh, it probably will be you know an hour though because we do have to get to a joint meeting at seven with the parks, which which you know we'll be going back to and you know that's going to take some time as well. So it's up to you. Um, I'm just gonna. I know we're not going to go back and forth saying the same option back and forth, but. I'm just letting you know that it could be a little while. If you'd still like to wait, great. Um, if you want to do it now, feel free. Okay, well, um, I don't have a copy of that letter because I didn't print it out. But if uh, Ryan were to read my letter to the board, I'd appreciate it. That'd be great. Ryan, you got that? Yes. Just gonna have to give me one second, I'm sorry. No problem. I have it as well if you want me to read it. Just just got it. Okay. Okay. So it said letter for the select board for Monday the 25th or tonight, February 1st. Gentlemen and ladies, having lived here in Hubberson since 1970, I feel a great passion for the town. Uh, please note this is Ed's words, not mine. Having served on many boards, I am concerned over the second breach of honesty by a town employee a tax collector who embezzled over $500,000 was shocking to say the least. Now a police department with an employee that was fined 10,000 by the state ethics board is of concern to many residents. In order to have residents and taxpayers of Hubberson feel confident again in our police department and town management, I would request that a preliminary investigation be done to ensure that the ethics violation has addressed all of those who were involved with the violation. That investigation could include getting all the testimony from the state ethics hearings for town select board review and also to do a forensic audit of the police department's town finances and all donations made to the police department in the last five years. Also knowing how the bids were solicited, who reviewed the bids and who awarded the bids would be of concern, I would think. I think just for statements from the select board or administration would not hold much water without having investigated the situation in order to reach a decision that can be shared with the town, including documentation showing that a good investigation was conducted. Thank you select board for listening to my suggestions. I thank you for your community service and I'm confident you will pursue this matter to a logical conclusion. Kindest, regard, kindest regards, Ed Blanchard, 23 East Comet Pond Road, Hubbardston, Mass, 01452. And I will spare you the cell phone. Oh, no, tell the cell, give him the cell. I, I refuse, I like Ed too much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ryan, well read. Okay, so Ryan, I, I'm gonna, you know, I'll give you a second to think about this as I ask you a question, but you know, some important things are in here and full disclosure, Ed and I spoke earlier in the week. Um, you know, there's some things obviously I could discuss with him, some things I couldn't, he understands that. Um, he's been in this a long time too. Um, but but there, there's, you know, a, a number of statements in there that are important, but, but one of them um, that's in there um, uh, that I'd like to just reread, which is towards the end there is, I think that just statements from the select board or administration will not hold much water without having investigated the situation in order to reach a decision that can be shared with the town, including documentation showing that a good investigation was conducted. Um, since a lot of it's not um, you know, public knowledge necessarily or, or quite yet, um, can, can you just go into a little bit for um, maybe the investigation that we know of that was done? You know, Not necessarily, I know some was done by us. Um, so whatever you feel comfortable sort of sharing, um, if you don't mind just sort of going, going through that with us and, and with Ed. Sure, and there, there are certain rules that protect employees to include the open meeting law and other laws. So um, I, need, I need to do my best to advise the board not, not to violate any of those, of course. Um, there was an investigation into this incident done internally um, at the time it happened with statements received from all parties. Um, there was, 
I would say not a lot of follow up from from the internal investigation four years ago uh, during this incident, a little more than four years ago. And then there was uh, change in town leadership for an interim and then, of course, myself and, you know, quite a bit has transpired transpired since then. So those documents are are, are public and available um, with certain restrictions. And I, I don't know if you want me to go into more than that, but that's where I'll start. I, I do. So that was the first phase of the investigation. The second, I would call it, um, is during this this new new time of discussion on this item. And, and there were sort of dual additional investigations. One was internal sort of by the town again, and the other was the State Ethics Commission. So we received notice from the State Ethics Commission that um, that many have seen in the, in the newspaper, local newspaper, which was that Detective Chatney was uh, admitted to ethics violations and was um, charged ten thousand dollars and signed a agreement stating that um, everything that was stated in the agreement was true which included admitting to the violations of, um, of town procurement and, and related laws and falsifying documents and i think it's important to state that that the detective was not the only one investigated or interviewed as part of the investigation that's right there were several people investigated. Um, the State Ethics Commission contacted the town as well to, for documentation, just similar as to anybody would with, with public records. And we complied fully and made all employees available with that, with those summons, not knowing what it was because they don't tell you what's going on while the investigation is going on. And those, um, the results of those um, investigation efforts by the State Ethics Commission were provided to us um, as part of their report. We received the disposition agreement from the State Ethics Commission, and that, that is what they've given us from their investigation. But there is no, as we know of, follow on investigations to any of the, the testimonies given. Right, okay. Okay, and then you've done your own internal um, review just to make sure that you, you understood the entire uh, situation. So I wouldn't necessarily call that uh, a re-internal investigation unless you would want to call it that, but, but something that's more current than the one that was done four or five years ago. So the, as soon as we found out, we placed Detective Chatney on administrative leave, which is uh, common practice as we looked into the, and, and did our due diligence. This gives us time and perspective as we understand what happened and then do our own internal investigation. So uh, I had the police department do, do an internal investigation to understand the incident, uh, to see if there were any criminal charges, which there were not, and to make sure that, that we understood how that applied to police policy and what may or may not have been violated. Um, Informed the Board of Selectmen of this. I also made sure that we researched and talked to anybody else that was involved at the time to understand the incident. And I don't know if you want to go into um, what I've done since since that time. Just I, do. I, I do. You know, I just I want to just air it all out here. So might as well uh, while we're all talking and thinking about it. So first, I'd like to thank um, Detective Chatney for his service to the community as a police officer. Obviously, we do not condone any of the actions found in the Ethics Commission report. But uh, a review of, of Detective Chatney's work here in Hubbardson would show, um, other than this incident, um, excellent service to the community. We did negotiate um, with Detective Chatney and a lawyer to um, accept his resignation, and that was done today at noon. So we have accepted Detective Chatney's, Chatney's resignation. We asked any employees involved to give a full accounting of their involvement to make sure that there was no additional ethics violations that we wanted to investigate and then worked with our town council to make sure that those statements matched um, any laws, including the ethics law, um, did due diligence with town council and on the ethics commission. And then um, we reprimanded any employees who violated the state who may have violated or perceived violation. It's a little tricky with the state ethics law because someone in my position, for example, um, even if it's perceived that I violated the ethics law, then it could be considered that I did. It's not necessarily that I did. So I can't use my position for, for um, personal gain, et cetera. Um, so it can get a little bit tricky. 
So then uh, you'll see later that I've recommended a policy addition to the Board of Selectmen that would prevent employees from contracting with each other, which is not a direct violation of the ethics law, but could be perceived and used if, if done in a certain manner. So to avoid that, they would have to file um, any disclosures if they were going to contract with each other. And certainly, if anybody's going to contract with the town, which is illegal if you file, which is legal if you file a disclosure, would be um, disclosed and on record and reviewed by town council if we were to even consider it, which wouldn't be my recommendation in 99% of the incidents uh, with the town. And then um, we will be having the police department go through um, significant training with the State Ethics Commission and the Attorney General's Office to make sure they understand the conflict of interest law and all paid employees will retake the conflict of interest law and sign an understanding of it and ask any questions necessary to include being able to sit with town council to fully understand the law. So we feel like we've taken significant steps to address an issue that in my opinion should have been addressed uh, at the time and um, and done in this way, which is to, to make sure that we're doing due diligence and training our employees to understand what can be a complicated uh, rule. And unfortunately, we lost a, a good employee over it. Although again, I will say I don't condone the action. Um, I, I feel like there was a lot of repercussions from this that were unfortunate. Um, thank you. You know, that was very detailed. I, I know I sort of put you on the spot on there. Um, so the, the only other thing I would like to add there is, is um, you know, much of what you've done has been because your position requires you to make decisions on what course of action to go, but also you consulted the Board of Selectmen, the Select Board, to provide some guidance on um, some of that path as well. Is that fair? Yes, so the uh, Detective Chatney is my, is my appointment by charter. But this is a this is a town decision, so it was in cons consultation with the board, the select board. I'm going to do that a lot too. This in consultation with the select board um, to make sure we were doing what it is is in the town's best interest and um, in protecting the town, but also trying to trying to learn and make sure this doesn't happen again, which I think is a very important piece of this. Um, need to make sure that that you have public confidence, and, and I think this is what it takes to gain that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, you know, Ed, you, you're the one um, uh, who, who um, sort of spurred on the discussion, which I appreciate you, you getting involved and, and coming on tonight. Is there anything you would like to add at this point? Uh, it's good to know that uh, going forward that we'll have a conflict of interest uh, training done and that the police department will all sign for that. I have one question uh, where all of the members of the police department asked if there was any involvement with them and Scott Chat and his company. Yes, I did ask that. Was there any uh, previous involvement with uh, Scott Chatney's company and other police officers? I can't speak directly to um, to any employee. I can say there have been incidences in the town where um, two employees engaged with each other for work or contracted for work. And I can say I reviewed that with council. So the, the ruling on that is, first of all, you probably shouldn't do it because of perception problems. But the, the only way that's a violation of the ethics laws if it's done with coercion or if it's done in a manner that would have someone receive a gift of more than $50. So if, if it can be proven that the contract was intentionally lowered in order to give someone or gain favor, or if you was done in a way that um, made someone feel like they, uh, their job was at risk, et cetera, then those are violations. They're tough to prove, but they are very serious violations of the conflict of interest law. Um, a simple contracting with another person or, or, or really anybody involved in town government is, is not necessarily a violation of the ethics law, but it should be disclosed anytime it's done which is why I'm recommending we add to our conflict of interest law policy that even if you're doing a, a contract that would be within the limits of the, the ethics law, that you disclose it and discuss it with me or the board of selectmen or someone to make sure that uh, we can ask counsel so that you don't get yourself in trouble. This happens a lot in small towns. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just that um, the, 
the businesses and the labor pool available it tends to to make people look within to trust each other and, and it can get you in trouble and it should be avoided if possible so what is your opinion regarding moving forward with a outside investigation versus internal my recommendation to the board is the um the steps in the the discipline that so far has been taken and just to, to jump in there so so ed as i previously stated and um that ryan had um you know proceeded down a path that we had all uh talked about at length uh for him going um the path included um the investigation that has been performed um it's not like we suggested something as the board of selectmen that ryan didn't do or or uh, push back against so um everything he's done um and all the investigations that have been done on this have been the one that the ones that the board has um been on on uh on board with hey dan can you hear me now yeah um is there do you think it would be wise to possibly get the depositions from all the witnesses at the ethics hearing just to so we could read through it i um i don't, I don't even know i mean I, I, I can't hurt, right? But I don't know what the steps are for that and what the public disclosure piece of it all is. I think we'd have to sort of find out without answering sort of off the cuff there. I have to just find out from somebody who knows better than me and maybe Ryan, unless Ryan knows the answer to this right off the bat. Um, I don't know. Do you, Ryan? I don't. Um, I would have to ask. I would imagine that because of this, I'm not even going to speculate. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Do you think that would be I can ask. So the information that you got from the uh, state ethics board, even though it wasn't there, all the individual testimonies, that's a uh, public record and available if requested? That's what I don't know, um, Ed, is whether or not the, um, the investigation materials from the state ethics commission are available. What I do have is the disp disposition agreement that was signed, which is a public document that details uh, this event and we looked at all of those details to see if there was any uh, violations or perceived violations and then went from there. Right. So just to add to that. So there are some details in the disposition agreement that, you know, would reference or pertain to uh, investigations done as part of the entire investigation specific to others that weren't just if you know what I'm getting at. So, yeah, there. But as far as the full on um uh documentation that, that i think pat's asking for and probably you too ed but that pat was specifically asking for that's something we we don't we don't have we just have references good references to it um so i, I guess that's something we can put on the list of things to request well if you're going to look into getting the uh the full testimony from the board i think that would be a great positive step and uh if they're available to the public, uh, could you apprise me of the same? And I'd go through the Public Information Act to uh, procure those. Well, you know. Okay. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Are um, you still in the keys? Hopefully, hopefully Thanks, get all plowed out. <laughs> Are you still in the keys? I just want everybody to know that you're sitting down there in the keys. Are you still in the keys? I am. Yeah, it's about. Mm, 72 degrees, but windy, but we're not complaining <laughs> about the wind. Is it windy, Ed? I bet. Uh, funny. You, right. guys, you, you guys are tough New Englanders. I've gotten to be a soft Floridian. Oh, uh, gosh. All right. Um, good thanks, night. Ed. Thank Have you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Um, well, we got to 7 o'clock uh, on that item there, so we're going to close open session again. Um, and, and again, if, if it needs to reopen, fine, but that was part of open session, just so everybody knows. And um, so it, we have, um, you know, uh, we have Sandy here. It, it says joint meeting, Parks Commission. We're not waiting for a quorum, though. Um, you know, are we, Ryan, as far as you know? You can, you can, you can add Sandy as a panelist now. We're hey, just Santa. discussing. We're just discussing things. Can you hear me? 
Yep. Oh, okay. So I just want you to know that I got two other members who can't get on, who are trying uh, to get on. Um, Jay Gurton and Brian Matheson. Sandy, I emailed you a new link. If you forward that to them, it should work. All right, Sandy, we're going to peel away for like five minutes and do a couple of quick items while yep. those guys um, get the the, um, the links and, and try to jump on. And we can see, obviously, on, on our Zoom whether or not they've popped on. So let's let's move on to to 4C for the moment, that'd be the 2021 Country Hen Scholarship, um, which is one of our favorites. This is a reminder to the board of, of this process to get it going. So I, I turn it over to the board for um, how you want us to, to proceed here or to set up a schedule. It doesn't have to be, it's a little bit early, but just wanted to keep this in the board's mind. No, I'm glad it's there. I mean, we've done it the same way the last few years. It's been two select board members. Jeff and I have been on it been two FinCom members, I'm sorry, school committee members. That's changed a little bit because it changed uh, who was on it. And then we have one member of the country hen, Sheila, who's, who's been part of the, the group of five that receives them and reads them and votes on them. And, and we sort of go from there and decide how many to give out. So um, I guess that's on the table again. I'm, I'm happy to, to do it again. Um, I guess I'll start with with that first, Jeff. Are you still happy to do it if, if the rest of the board wants us to, if no one else? Yes, I would. I, I would enjoy still still doing it. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, again, we've, I've had my opportunities too. So if, if anyone else is interested in, in doing it in lieu of one of us or both of us, um, let us know. Otherwise, you know, it sounds like we're both ready to, to, to do that again. Okay. All right. Well, let's just keep it the same way there, Ryan. So I, I can't remember what our, our, I feel like we extended it both years, the last two years a little bit um, from like May 1st to some other date, but can we use May 1st right now as the, uh, the, the date where um, they're due? Yes. Okay, sounds good. And then we can just get it out to the normal um, places that we, we get it, which is to the, the schools and then through social media to be able to, to put them out there. Hopefully we get some good responses. Absolutely. And good. It's good. This is a great, great scholarship and, and something great the board does. Yep. Okay. Well, it sounds good. Thanks for bringing it up. Hey, Ryan. Yes. Yes. Can you send that information directly to me also, please? The country hen? The requirements to submit a proposal for the scholarship? Yes, of course. Thank you. All right, I see Dave Sacramone on there. They still don't quite have a quorum, so let's, we can move on for another minute here and see if there's something else that we can do that's relatively quick. Um, will the, the item 4D, the DLTA application town center district overlay um, be sort of a quickish item? I think so. So you've used, and I put this in your packet, you've used DLTA before. So DLTA is local assistance given as a direct grant, meaning not money, but services to MRPC. So MRPC is our, our local planning organization. They've done a lot of work on our master plan. So one of the items identified by the Economic Development Committee was investigating the idea of increasing businesses along Route 68, which is not an uncommon topic, or creating what they would call a town center district overlay. An overlay being certain things are allowed within this area. So in order to inform that discussion and, and give a recommendation, and this does not mean that it's going to be done or there, there's definitely an increase in business, but to investigate what it would look like, I contacted MRPC to see if you can use the DLTA funds for this. And they, they said, yes, they, they've done this before and it would be a great use of the money. So the Economic Development Committee voted on on this uh, applying for DLTA grant and um, looking to see if the select board would also approve the use of this grant for that reason and allow Dan to sign a letter that would um, make our make our grant application more competitive and it's due tomorrow so. Sounds good so you need a, a motion for the board to be able to authorize that or, or what. Yeah, so the motion would be to. Uh, approve the application um, 
as presented for for a DLTA grant in order to work on a town center overlay district bylaw. Okay. I'll make the motion if you can still hear me. Just again, help feed me the words again to <laughs> approve the application. For DLTA help grant. Help me out, Ryan. Of the DLTA grant. As presented, would be fine. As fine. presented. I'll second that. Katie seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote roll call. Dan, yes. Chris? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Katie? Yes. And Pat? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. So it looks like we've got um, Brian Matheson, uh, Dave Sacramoni, Jay Gurton, and Sanda on with us. Uh, you want to make them all panelists here, and then Sanda can um, um, get that joint meeting opened because they have a quorum. So, Sandy, you're good. Everybody's in. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for inviting us to have a joint meeting with you. I'm, um, I don't know exactly what you want to talk about. We have a few topics to, to discuss that we were wondering. Um, looking for some assistance with the Board of Selectmen. Sounds okay. good. That's what we were looking for. Is okay. uh, You want to just start the conversation then on, we'll get sure. right into it there on, on some of those things. Um, you know, we've, we've been waiting for a little while to talk to you guys. I know things didn't, didn't quite come together for a little bit for various reasons, but we're here now. So we'd love to sort of get right into it. Okay, so um, our, our big project moving forward is the uh, playground. Um, so as you know, the town voted um, Parks to have a $200,000 CPA grant. And um, we'd like to get that started as soon as possible. So before we applied for the grant and everything to keep costs down, we approached you, um, the board, in regards to having the DPW get involved, having the DPW get involved with um, removal of all the old equipment that's there and the P stone and everything and get that all cleared out. So we'll have a nice clean slate to start with, with the playground and that saves a significant amount of money. Um, when we talked to different vendors, they all said, your DPW takes it down. Cause we asked them who, who takes down the playground and they all said the same thing. So I guess we just want to make sure we have the backing on that. Um, it's going to be a lot of work if we have to end up hiring someone to take that down if we can get the DPW to do it. Uh, so, you, you, you definitely do. I mean, as long as it's not like on a night like tonight. Um, <laughs> yes. But I assume, you know, you, uh, you know, I, 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 the way we're funding it now, which is great, the town is in favor for this. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some flexibility, obviously, we're not tied to any grant sort of system necessarily. I know there are, you know, um, you know, fiscal years and all that to consider, but it doesn't feel like, um, you know, you've got some flexibility on, on, you know, when they're available to be able to go do it, I assume. And, and then, you know, just let us know when you need it done and, and we'll talk to them about working it into their schedule. Okay. So how much leeway do you think we would need for them? I mean, obviously we have to wait till spring, but we're, we're really hoping to have the playground ready to be worked on come like May 1st. Okay. Well, I mean, that should be enough information. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to talk to Travis probably not tonight because I'm sure he's out plying, but uh, plowing, but we plan on, on, you know, talking to him soon anyway. And that's something we, you know, it's a, it's a joint sort of town effort. These are the things we're, we're supposed to be doing here. So, you know, demolition is much quicker than construction. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully we can, we can um, talk to them and get back to you specifics on specifics on that. But now that we know that, that you'd like it ready for May 1st, we, um, you know, we have a goal. That's great. Um, I don't know if we need to look into anything. Like, I don't know if any of that equipment can actually be recycled or, I don't know if they want to reuse that P stone, whatever. I mean, do we need to look at an, anything for that, especially the recycling part of it? I, uh, when talking with some of the vendors, they said a lot of that metal can actually be recycled. I don't know if that's something we just want to give to our recycling center. Maybe they would have some contacts. I'm not sure. Well, maybe that's a good question. So what I, I you know, I'll talk to um, Travis uh, after, you know, the meeting at some point when he's got some time to sleep and maybe I can meet him up there or, or you know, some of us can meet him up there to sort of go over the scope um, and discuss some of those things with it uh, in addition to schedule and, you know, maybe get back to you there with some ideas we have. Is that all right? That sounds great. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, any else on the, the playground? I guess might, might as well. I might ask. So, um, I is this a um, uh, a playground package that you've you've already sort of sourced out to any vendors, um, or is that part of the next you know piece of the process? That's the next piece of the process. We obviously got um, three estimates for the CPA grant. You need to do that. And so we have actually met with three different vendors and I'm gonna be working with Ryan in regards to um, how, we go, how we move forward from here. Is it expected just cause you know, some of us who have been around a while, you know, remember the community build sort of thing at the school, which, which um, was quite an effort and a, a different way of doing things based on how the money was acquired. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's not the case for this. Is that right? So that's correct. So a, a couple of things, number one, because of COVID, I don't even know, you know, last year, every, our hands were tied, like, how do we even move forward with um, community build? And the vendors all told us we would need like 45 people to volunteer to do that. So, so as the parks may, we've talked about it and we felt we didn't have that type of a volunteer base, unlike the PTA who was involved in the school every day and involved with parents every day. So we have chosen to have them um, build it themselves. Okay. And they do have different plans for building. Um, they, have they have like three different options that you can go with, a full community build, a full build with them, or a, even a hybrid between the two. Okay, that's cool. I don't know if anyone else on, on either board, everyone's sort of active right now, has anything they want to add to the playground discussion. So in I addition to that, the um, the the one of the, at least one of the vendors the the turnaround time for building the new playground if they just do it themselves is much quicker than having a community build do it so we were, we we also figured just for the expedition of getting um, getting the actual playground built just to have them do it so it would go quicker smoother faster and be done right how long would it take on average if they did it all themselves. I, Santa, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think he said it would be it would be about a week from start to finish if if the the old playground is demoed and ready, you know, and the the land is ready to go. Yeah, actually, I think he said like three to five days as long as they had good weather. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's moving right along. I'm sure they go in and set all the foundations first, and then just um, sort of go from there when everything hardens up. So. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Anything else on the um, on the playground, Ryan? Uh, Sandra, if you could just talk. So we we did a lot with the CIPC this year. Um, some upcoming projects, and that matches well with the board of selectmen's goal to to keep Curtis Rec Fields, you know, pristine and, and usable. So can you talk about some of the stuff you added to the capital plan that will help the Curtis Rec Field in the coming years? Just briefly touch on it, maybe. Sure. So. Um... So the first thing on our plan obviously was to um, get a new playground or replace equipment, but with us being successful with the CPA grant, um, that was able to be taken off actually the capital plan. So that was really nice. The next thing we have is the bandstand roof um, that we're working with the Lions Club because that roof is actually pretty deteriorated and really needs to be replaced. And that bandstand gets quite a bit of use, even if it's just families sitting up there to have a picnic. So, um, so that actually got approved this past June. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, get some contract up there to get someone to actually do that this spring. And we are working with the, the Lions Club with that, um, with a member of that to, to pick a contractor. The other things that really need to be done, we need to have, um, the basketball court really needs to be sealed. Um, we had to wait for that. We didn't have enough money when we originally built it to have it done. So we are looking to get that done so we can keep that in as good of a shape as possible for as many years as we can. The other big issue that we are really looking at is uh, the walking track. Uh, the walking track needs quite a bit of work and it's going to be a lot of money to replace it. So. Actually, at our last meeting, we were actually kind of talking about, like, did the DPW get like a cold patch machine or some type of car machine or something? Hot box. A hot, hot box. box. I, I don't really know what a hot box does, but it was brought up that maybe they could actually go up and 
repair some of the cracks that are up there and maybe just do some band-aid repair for now to make it a little better um, while we kind of come up with a plan to have uh, to how to get the funding to to do the whole track because we did get some estimates and they were like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So yeah, if we do wow. that whole track. It's a big track. It's almost a half mile long. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll talk to Travis about that, too. So, um, you know, that hot box, basically what it does is it makes it so that you can do exactly what you just said. It, it keeps the asphalt at a, a temperature it needs to be at uh, as you place it either in cold weather like this, if you've got to really do like an emergency or if you're going to be placing it slowly so that it doesn't cool in the back of the truck. That's open air. It's actually a hot box. So if you're going to do something like this, um, you know that that might be you know beneficial for it. So I'll I'll, I'll ask him see what his thoughts are. Uh, you know as far as efficiencies and time and all that sort of stuff, and and I'll be able to get back to you. Oh, that'd be great. Um, that's all I have, unless another member has something else they'd like to add. Okay, they're being quiet. How about the select board? Do you guys have anything um, for Sando or, or anyone else at the parks that you guys want to um, uh, bring up or, or get clarification on or anything? No one's going to ask about the ice rink. Come on, really? I will. <laughs> I'm just curious, uh, not only for myself, because my son is a hockey player, but I have had a couple of friends of mine in town who were curious who actually – is responsible for overseeing the upkeep of the rink because you get, for example, like we are tonight, a storm. So therefore the ice has to be clear, cleared. Who keeps the ice level? Are they doing it with hot water, et cetera? Who is overseeing it? Well, first of all, you have to have ice to do that. And unfortunately we've been unsuccessful. Um, so what happened is when you put your ice in, from what we've been told, you need to layer it. You need to do like three inches, let that freeze up, put like three more inches, let that freeze up. Well, unfortunately, in between the putting the different level layers up there, um, some kids got on there with skates. They skated, they broke through the ice and they slit the liner in more than one place. And so, when we realized we were losing water, we went and we patched where we saw some slits. And um, so then we had DPW, uh, not DPW, the fire department who's been so patient and so kind with us. They put more water in and then water was leaking out somewhere else. So this past weekend, we were up there in the freezing weather um, for like an hour, just trying to figure out. And the bottom line is there's just too many slits in the liner and that we just said, there's just no way we can save this line. So when there were parts where water froze really well, and there were sections where the water would leak out, so there'd be huge air pockets under the ice and the ice would just smash through. So we just threw our hands up in the air and said, there's no way we can get all this ice out to put a whole new liner in, so we just can't, we have to wait till next year. And we're trying to figure out what's the best way to keep people off the ice. We had caught some tape all up there, but curiosity, the kids, whoever it was, we don't know who it is. It doesn't matter at this point, but um, there's multiple, multiple slits in that liner and we just cannot keep the water in. But that being said, kids like have fun, which I'm very happy. So on one end of the, um, the rink, there's quite a bit of ice. In the middle, there's no ice. On the other end of the rink, there's quite a bit of ice and kids were actually skating on it like on Sunday because people saw them. So someone was using it, but we as a town, we're not gonna maintain it at this point. It, it doesn't make sense to put any more water in it. It just won't hold all the water on, on the whole rink. Um, but going forward next year, we were looking Jeff to have um, a local high schooler apply to um, work for the parks and maintain it. And then if there was a big storm like this, we would go down obviously and help them clear it out because it's gonna take a lot of manpower and we can't expect an 18 year old you know, kid to get that all shoveled out with weather like this. But that was our plan. We would put it in our budget to hire um, a high schooler to come and try to maintain it or someone who would be interested in doing that. Hey Sanda, I have one question. 
Um, and a number of people have asked me, how come um, it wasn't placed on the basketball court on the asphalt? Is there is there a specific reason or? Yeah, we did discuss that because that was uh, that was some place we were we did discuss some of our concerns was um, ruining the top of the basketball court because um, because that gets used. I mean, you'll find people down there playing on a nice winter day. So our biggest concern was to protect that basketball court. That was a very expensive, um, you know, uh, court that we put up there, and we actually have to get it sealed. So we didn't want to put it there for that reason. And our other thoughts were, if we had an early spring, we would feel really bad to have this big ice rink on the basketball court if you had kids who wanted to go down and play ball and couldn't because you have to wait for the ice to melt to move the rink. So we chose not to put it there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Sander. You're welcome. Okay, anything else from anybody? Jay, you don't sound from this planet. Yeah. Oh. Jay? How about that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Took my headphones out. I just wanted to highlight real quick that uh, besides the efforts of the parks, um, uh, the Hubberston Fire Department was really awesome and accommodating and helping us with the skate park. I mean, with the uh, ice rink. Uh, Jeremy Gosla of <clears throat> uh, has been in touch uh, numerous times and gone way out of uh, out of his way to help us and try to make this work. So I know it was uh, a bit of a failure this year, but we'll be successful next year. But I just wanted to make sure. <clears throat> the fire department and Jeremy were recognized uh, publicly for their efforts because they really, really were uh, very helpful. So that's all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jay. And thanks to the, the fire department. I, I'm pretty sure all of us have driven by and seen them up there helping out at some point this year um, mm -hmm. as you guys tried to make it work. So that's great. Uh, okay. I guess that's, I guess that's it. Um, uh, Sanda, I guess you'd probably, um, you guys had, had a quorum here. You'd probably, Ryan, they're official, right? So they're probably uh, a motion to adjourn and all that. Yes. On our, on our side. I'll motion to adjourn. Okay. I'll second. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Have a good night. Right, Can I ask you. a quick question? Not about parks, though, before we move on. Do okay. you want me to be here for the appointment of um, Dolores Ordway for CPC? That's later on in your agenda. Yep. I don't know, Ryan. What do you, what do you think? It, it's a CPC appointment uh, that's, that's in your file. So if, if you believe that Sanda would would add to it or if you want to deal with it now we will deal with it now so we're going to jump ahead to um so that the the um, parks meeting is now closed and and the uh, joint meeting uh with the select board which is item 4a is is now complete uh we are going to jump ahead real quick just to item 8e which is an, uh, the appointments and resignations and and we have uh one on the table for uh dolores ordway uh to the cpc uh ryan can you give us some details here Yes, am I on mute? No, you can hear me. I, um, they reached, the CPC reached out uh, through Sanda for the appointment of, of Dolores Ordway. So she sent you a, a letter of interest asking to be a at-large member of the, uh, <clears throat> of the CPC. And her letter, she said she's lived in town for, for quite a long time. She detailed um, a significant amount of personal and, and town experience and some of her interests. So this is brought before the board for your appointment to the CPC if you so choose. Okay, um, how does this do to the um, CPC numbers? You know offhand? Uh, yeah, it definitely adds to them. Um, I think we're down three members um, and, she, and she would become a member at large. 
we have Barbara who was actually resigning and she was uh, his, uh, from the historical society or committee. So Dolores is not on any committee, but she's a member at large. So we did have a member at large opening. All right, sounds good. And did, did you did you just because you're on? Did you did you did you recruit? Did you have to recruit, or or did this come um, without you knowing it was coming? No, I I did not know she was coming. I wasn't even sure Barbara was resigning until we had our meeting in January, and then it got brought up. And then Dolores just reached out to me and said she'd like to be uh, she'd be interested in joining. So okay. All right. That sounds I'll like reason. Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted somebody. Go ahead. No. I'll make a motion to appoint Dolores Ordway to CPC. Second it. Good, second it. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, we will vote roll call. Dan, yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Katie? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Okay, it is unanimous. Um, okay, thanks, Sandra. Great, thank you very much. All right. Um, okay, we will move back, uh, bouncing around a little bit tonight, but item 4E, which is the contract approvals, we have a number of them. Uh, we've been busy. Ryan specifically has been busy. Uh, you've probably seen them all in your packets. Um, I'm just going to read what they are first, and then we can, we can go into them. But the first would be the, the town administrator from 2021 to 2023. That's Ryan, the DPW union contract, for fiscal year 22 through 24. The police union contract, fiscal year 22 to 24. Veteran services, fiscal year 22 to 24. And that's an intermunicipal agreement. And then the document management project, which is grant funded, uh, UMass Boston, uh, Kyocera, which, uh, which is the laser fiche, which is um, uh, the scanning. Uh, and then data bank IMX scanning as well. Um, Ryan, you take back a lease as you as you want or, or what you need from us. Obviously, we need to vote on on all of these. Um, do you want to go through them individually? I mean, we've talked about them for for some of them for months, so we know all the info on there. I guess maybe what you think is important is is important to us. Um, I can uh, get into detail on any changes or give a high level summary. The, these will be posted publicly, and I know the board has deliberated on most of them. Um, you tell me. Now I'll execute either. All right. I, I mean, unless I'm just going to state my opinion based on, you know, being present at, at the previous discussions of these. Um, it doesn't feel uh, like we need to discuss, uh, unless anyone wants to, of course, the town administrator, A, the DBW union contract, B, the police union contract, C. Uh, the other two, D and E, we've talked about less. We've seen some information on them. So so I'm, I'm okay if you give a higher level sort of description of of D and E, and then we we can uh, go back for a vote on ABC if everyone's okay with that. Okay, so just say that again. D, D and E, yeah. Veteran service. Just give us some, some more you know, high level on that, and then um, the the grant. Okay, so the um, as found in your packets and available to the public, we got a grant from the Community Compact uh, IT Grant Program, which allows towns, municipalities in Massachusetts to apply for improvements in their in information technology. So we put together a grant this year to try and paperless is kind of a out of vogue term, but to digitize our records for several reasons. One, it will create space in the town offices, which um, we already needed, but in COVID times, we certainly do. It creates more social distancing room and gives us more room for employees. It also makes sure that every document we have is, is properly placed and that we are more accurate and efficient with our records retrieval for records requests. And then a third component of it was the so-called street files, which is files that are kept on every address, which are public documents um, that people have to search through which can be a little inconvenient or a lot inconvenient in COVID times will now be available or public facing, meaning people can go in and see building permits and other documents that they request from us 24 hours a day on the website. So it's a pretty significant project, but I think it's um, where almost all towns are going. We'd be ahead of other small towns, but it doesn't mean that we don't need it any more than, than big cities. So the UMass Boston contract is a project manager. They will work with each department to make sure that we continue to function while we're doing this big project, make sure that our, our naming file conventions and, and other parts of the projects are consistent with other projects around, around the state and generally keep the project moving forward. 
they do this a lot and have done it for us before and they, they do a good job. And this was built into the grant. So we, we'd asked for this originally. The second part is the laser fiche, which is the content management system. So that is a, a, a cloud-based software that'll store all of, all of our files. So for example, if someone wanted to ask for a public record from, from long ago about, um, about anything really, employee or a contract, et cetera, we can use keywords in search in a very specific manner to find that document quickly. We can also store them quickly and create less paper a lot less paper by just digitizing records ourselves and putting them into this, this system. And then of course we have, you know, thousands, literally 500,000 plus records in the town offices, our small town offices that we would scan. So they will take them off premises, will still be available to us if anybody wants them, but they'll scan them and put them properly stored into our content management system. And they'd be available immediately for us to search and use. So it's, a, it's an ambitious project, but it's doable with our project manager. So the three contracts involved in that are the UMass Boston contract, the, uh, the Kyocera contract, which is the content management system, and the databank IMX contract, which is for the back files and scanning. Again, 500,000 documents that they're gonna come get. So we expect this project to take about a year because it's a really big project and we don't want it to interrupt with our day-to-day -day flow. So um, we're going to take our time and do it right. And we, we don't actually do much, right? I mean, they've got a project manager and everything. They, they are really organizing the whole effort. Yes. And the specific in that is the training of employees to make sure that the naming conventions stick and that they know how to access documents. Our staff is um, already doing that internally on you know, kind of a made up, made up internal drive, but this will make sure everyone's doing it exactly the same. So um, when a, a new employee comes in, they're just following into a system that, that works and is vetted and they, they just do that. So there's a lot of continuity to it as well, instead of recreating filing every time we hire somebody. Okay. Um, okay, thanks for the, that. And, and then I guess if you could just give us, uh, for the Veterans uh, Services Intermunicipal Agreement, um, you know, I, I know you did note that it is seems like a, um, a fair amount of money and, and, you know, you sort of, you need it if you need it type thing, right? So we share an employee with the town of Westminster, uh, Sarah Wyman, who's our excellent VSO. Um, she's very much professionalized the position. Our, everything is turned in on time accurately and veterans are contacted when they need to. She's also really good at uh, and certified to apply for VA benefits. So we're happy with the shared arrangement and investing in sharing this employee has allowed us to, again, professionalize the position um, but we get less hours in the agreement than, than Westminster does, or um, they also share in Ashburnham, but now we're just doing the agreement between each town. So they've agreed to level fund our contract for the next three years and continue it at 8,000 a year for veteran service services. Okay, um, thanks. Anyone have any questions about uh, any of these, um, these contracts? Um, if not, um, I think we take them one at a time and, and move down from A to E and, and um, you know, discuss uh, whether to, to um, approve them. Okay, we can just do them individually now. So the first one would be the town administrator 2021 to 2023 contract. So just sorry to interrupt. So the motion will be to, for me to sign or, or for um, just general approval. To approve the contract and then all of you will sign it. I make a motion to approve the uh, town administrator uh, contract. Second it. Seconded. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Matt? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Next is the DPW union contract. Make a motion to accept the DPW union contract. I'll second that. Pat seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll vote roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Um, the next will be the police union contract. Make a motion to accept the police union contract. Second. 
Okay, seconded by Pat. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote roll call. Dan, yes. Uh, Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, next is the Veter Veteran Services IMA. Make a motion to accept the Veteran Service IMA contract. Second. Seconded by Pat. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll vote roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, and then we're on to the last one. Ryan, um, the document management project, do we have to do three individual or one uh, that encompasses the entire document management project? It, it would be better if you did each individually, Dan. All right, so we're just going to do one. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. So uh, we'll do UMass Boston first. All right, I make the motion to accept the UMass Boston. What else should I be including? Uh, document management contract. Thank you. Make a motion to the UMass Boston document management contract. Well, second. Second by Pat. Um, any discussion? None. Uh, we'll vote. Uh, roll call, Dan. Yes. Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. The next would be the Kyocera or, yeah, Kyocera document management contract. But Make a motion to accept the Kia Sierra document management contract. I'll second. Seconded by Pat. Any discussion? Okay, we'll vote roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Matt? Yep. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. <laughs> and our last one will be the, uh, the databank IMX document management contract. Make a motion to accept the, again, um, the databank IMX document management. Thank you. Management. Make a motion to accept the databank IMX contract as presented. I'll second. Seconded by Pat. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Dan, yes. Uh, uh, Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, we are through that. So next would be some old business. Um, so Dan, Dan yeah. just very briefly, um, all of the old contracts and new contracts will be put on the town website so people can review them. And I just like to say just very briefly, um, working for the town has been the highlight of my, my professional career to date. I really appreciate um, the support of the community and this board of selectmen. So it um, looks like three more years for me and I'm very excited to continue the work we've done. Well, thanks, Ryan. We've, um, you know, we, we, we're a volunteer board um, and we take it very seriously, but, you know, we, we need somebody who we can trust and we've put all of our trust into you and are reaffirming that with a, a new contract. So I think you, that sort of shows how we feel as well. So, um, you know, on to, uh, on to the next one after this, I guess, right? You don't have to answer. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so back to the old business. Um, we are we have the high street reconstruction project, which looks like it's it's also going to require us to actually finally deal with it and um, and decide. So this project's come up a couple times, and I've I've sent you more data in, in case you're ready to to make another decision here under old business. So this would be an extension of the town center project, which would analyze the the high street area as an extension of the town center, whether through, through sidewalks or uh, repaving or reconstruction. And uh, it would be a high level design as the town's done in the past with the, with the intention of using that information to target grants for, for actual reconstruction, whether that be a MassWorks grant or state tip or complete streets. Um, the analysis you asked me to do is, is can we afford this? Um, we have about Fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars left in um, design funds from the town center project in previous town town votes, which this would continue that project to to rehabilitate the town center, and um, you could use from your selectman services account uh, the remainder of the contract, which is about eight to nine thousand, 
Uh, this would stretch that that budget, but I do believe that if we control costs the way we have been, the budget could make it uh, to the end of the year. So if the board uh, wanted to do this contract as it's expressed that it might want to, we could afford it in, in the current budget structure. Okay, well, um, I guess, you know, we can do it either way. Uh, we, can, we can discuss it right now, or if somebody's interested in making a motion either in favor or against uh, this, we could, we could discuss it during the discussion part of the motion process. So anyone wanna start the uh, discussion? Well, I don't know what the motion is specifically, but that's something I, I would say be in favor of. Yeah, as would I, um, you know, just sort of keep moving forward here for, you know, we, we, we it's sort of logarithmic, the amount of uh, money that we got spent for us by the federal government and state on, you know, the other projects we've done over the last eight years, including North and South 68 and what's to come from the town center project. So if it's not, you know, if it's something that's going to debilitate us, um, you know, I definitely, definitely wouldn't be for it. But, it, you know, we've got an engineering firm that we feel good about and comfortable with who we know will go. We've asked them. We put them on the spot. And basically, you're going to go above and beyond for this so small amount of money to still give us a good product, which they did before and have agreed to again uh, with a with an initial sort of schematic design on this. So I... And for those reasons, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to, to keep moving on it. Um, so, I don't know. How would it best be worded then as a motion, Ryan? To contract with TEC to continue the town center design project up High Street. Make the motion to contract with TEC to continue the contract on the uh, High Street project. I'll second that. Okay, seconded by Katie. Um, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Uh, this will be a roll call. And yes, Katie? Yes. Matt? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, excellent. That is unanimous. So, Ryan, you'll let TEC know to, to get going? Uh, yes, we'll do that tomorrow. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, all right. So we next have item 5B, uh, which is a winter storm update. We obviously don't have um, Travis. We better not have Travis on here right now because that means he's either not working or doing it while he's driving. Uh, either or, or both of them are bad. Um, but Ryan, you did say he gave you some information. Um, he, he wasn't able to get to that today, but we are um, asking you to hold a board uh, board hold a meeting on February 11th. So if the board is willing to hold another meeting next Thursday, because we, we just have a lot of stuff to do, as you can see, uh, he can come to that and provide you an update. Uh, the, the storm really, really put him behind. Sounds good. So you, you can, you know, put it on that agenda. And then um, if, if all of us could, could, if you haven't yet getting back to Ryan about whether or not you're available for February 11th, um, you know, sometime after this meeting, um, then we can we can confirm that. Okay, um, so next is uh, 5C, which is the town administrator evaluation. So last time we met, um, I think I, I in, in addition to sending out the, the blank template um, that, that has the um, town administrator review items on there, um, of uh, getting it back to uh, to us by February 14th. So that I think that might be a Sunday. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was like by the end of the day, February 14th. So it still gives us a couple of weeks. Uh, I think uh, one or more of us have submitted them already. But if if we could just stick to that date, um, Brian, it looks like you know, per your recent correspondence, that that will work just fine. Yep. This is just a reminder. Yep. Um, you're all busy and like you said, volunteers. So just reminding you of that process. Um, sounds good. So uh, February 14th, we'll get we'll get them in. Um, okay, uh, so you're up next. Um, the town administrator report with uh, with some some updates.
for my town administrator report sent to you uh, over the weekend. So COVID-19, uh, you're getting used to these highlights and the public's getting used to seeing them in this forum. The, the bottom line up front here, to borrow a term of the military, is that our rate of positivity is lower. Um, instead of 25 cases, we now have 21 and the positivity rate for testing has gone down, but it's still a, a pretty, pretty significant 5%. Bordering towns of Westminster, Gardner, Templeton, Barry, and Rutland are still in a red status, but all of those have been decreasing. Uh, Princeton, which had been decreasing, has increased to a yellow status and is the only neighboring town to see an increase. So overall, the trend appears to be lowering in the area, uh, although the numbers are still pretty high. So that is, that is some good news. In my department report, um, as, as I've reported to the board and, and maybe not publicly yet, I have been, um, activated for a year-long deployment with the National Guard, uh, details to be determined. Uh, this will occur in March. So I've been meeting with all of our departments to make sure there's a long-term plan for an interim or temporary town administrator. These meetings are focusing on the 21 and 22 budgets to make sure there's continuity and a baseline for, for, the, for the replacement to, to work from which I think is important because continuity will allow us to continue these, these many, many important projects. I'll also be available um, despite, despite the deployment for continuing this continuity with the temporary TA and have narrowed it down to three candidates, which I'll be sending the board information about this week to set a timeline for, for your decision on, on that appointment as, you, as you've asked me to do uh, previously. And then, as you saw tonight, all the major FY22 contracts are now in place and approved by you. So that was part of that effort and, and why we had so many. Um, in terms of financial management, all the 22 budget assessments and estimates have been submitted except for regional dispatch and our two schools. The schools really do wait for the governor's budget, which came in last week. So we didn't expect them now. I should get Monty Tech this week. And then the QRSD assessment usually comes in in early March. I uh, will be presenting my town administrator budget to you on March 1st. So far in FY22, revenue projections are stronger than anticipated with a tremendous amount of new growth for Hubbardston based off of um, a long overdue solar project kicking off on Williamsville Road, which adds about $70,000 in, in new growth to our budget. The level service budget that we just got from the state um, means that we don't have to fear a decrease in local state aid which puts us at a, in a decent spot, although we still have a long-term budget deficit and uh, we continue to use free cash. I do think that I'll be able to present a balanced budget that has um, reasonable, reasonable increases for, for education, public safety, and our employees. So this is a positive development, especially given where we were at this point last year. Um, but this does mean we still have to control costs through the contracts that were signed today and um, discussions with the schools and our regional partners about assessments. One piece of bad news that you will see that I just, I just want out there is uh, our retirement assessment had its largest increase in history, over 50,000 uh, or 15% increase, which was, which was a big whack, which is why, although we have increased revenues, you know, I'm, still, I'm still predicting that we need to control costs. So, so something to uh, look forward to in my budget presentation, that uh, unavoidable increase in assessment. Another not good piece of budget news, the Hubbardson Center School elevator continues to demonstrate faults. It stopped the other day and they were fearful that it would not start again, which has some implications um, for not only safety, but for building code, et cetera. So this repair could cost north of $70,000 and is a pretty significant blow to our capital plan. Um, the faults continue right now, it's working then we, we could actually need to call an emergency town meeting to authorize the repair of this, of this project. This is our building and it is our responsibility. Uh, if the situation holds, then I will be recommending that this go into the annual town meeting warrant as a capital item, which um, could either delay many of our capital projects or exhaust our capital stabilization fund, if that's the way, it's probably what I'll be recommending, but of course it's a board vote. I'll take any questions after on that. If you have any more, I, I know I did send that to you. It's the first time we've discussed it publicly. The uh, many projects that you heard about today are, are ongoing to include uh, the document management program, which is now contracted. 
We are trying to procure from a while ago the reconfiguration of our town's baseball fields. This will be a great project. And then um, we're looking to continue the center school roof project and start bidding next month, which will be exciting to get the roof fixed. In terms of employee recognition, recognition, I'd like to recognize yeah. Mallory. Sorry to, you, can I just jump in real quick? Sure. Can you just, just because it's been around for so long, the, the exhaust uh, mitigation system? Yes. So the submittals were um, were accepted by both the engineer and the installer. So the parts have been ordered, and as soon as they're in, it's a backlog for these types of parts. As soon as they're in, they'll start the installation process. They walk through with the chief. So this project's moving and is going to be done by the end of the year, which is nice because it has been a while. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I was talking about Mallory. Um, also, Michael Stotter, who's a name that you might recognize in our hardworking Board of Health for their attention to our upcoming vaccination plan. So Michael was appointed by the Board of Health to serve as the medical advisor for this effort. He immediately assembled a team of volunteers to assist with the vaccination process, which, which was extremely nice. And we're talking dozens of people donating their time to, to help this happen. So Mallory has been working with the Board of Health and the state to make sure that we're following the program um, and, and looking for you know, grant funding. This will, be, this will be grant or state funded. Uh, she's been fielding resident questions. There's obviously a lot of questions from residents who are, who are in some cases desperate to get the vaccine or wanna make sure that they don't get missed because they might not have access to our, our plentiful online notifications. So she's been writing down their names to make sure she contacts them. We've also um, told them that we'll do a reverse 911 when these become available. And I saw today, although I was out of the office, that she put out a, a post about how residents can sign up for an interest in the vaccine using a Google form on the town website. So uh, we encourage you to reach out to your loved ones, neighbors and peers if they didn't see that to go on the town website uh, or call Mallory, she'll fill one out for you, uh, an interest form so that we can notify you when the vaccines come. They're gonna come quick. So although it's been slow, when they do come, they're gonna be rolled out quickly with a nice plan. And um, all of the people involved deserve a tremendous amount of credit for making this happen. Um, all the news from the federal and state level about this plan being, being floated, but not necessarily funded or, or directed is true at the local level. Um, so the amazing amount of work that went into this, hopefully we can start the vaccination process soon and, and get on with the rest of our lives. When are they coming? We do believe that they'll be here this month. All right, thank you. That's, that's great. Um, you know, what an what a unbelievable effort to have to do that 300 times per state, you know. Uh, or in the country, if that, that's yeah. actually what happens. It's just, it boggles the mind. Okay, um, all right, thanks a lot, Ryan. Um, so we've got uh, a very important policy to review here. We've got the uh, conflict of interest policy. So this was, um, you know, some information you had uh, gone into previously uh, in, in some more detail tonight, which uh, is, was in our existing conflict of interest policy um, adding some, some language to prohibit contracting between employees without disclosure? Yes, so the, the thing to understand here is that uh, gifts between employees or, or gifts to town officials is, is not necessarily a violation of the conflict of interest law, but it's sticky because although there's a $50 threshold, any perceived value is included in that to include any coercion or, uh, for example, if required employees to give me gifts, which I do not, um, that would be maybe seen as an order by people because of my supervision powers or the powers I have in the charter. So understanding the conflict of interest law is, is not simple. There's a lot of instances that aren't specifically covered in the law and perception really matters. So I'm recommending to the board that um, employees, and I'll just read it verbatim, that this be added to the conflict of interest law here, that employees must not within the limits of law limits of the law enter into a contract with another town of Hubberson employee or supervisor without disclosing the contract to the town administrator or the town administrators designate. So this would uh, prevent employees from potentially contracting with each other in a way that would violate any conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't engage with each other. If a review of it by by legal counsel myself or with the proper disclosure, it would be allowed. 
So I think this is a safeguard that we should put in place, especially given um, the unfortunate news from, from a couple of weeks ago uh, from an event that happened. Um, I think this is a, this is a pretty strict reaction to, to that in a preventative measure that, that should help install public trust in our employee processes. Okay, just the, so the, the town administrator's designee, what, what, what does that mean? So that's in a lot of the um, policies in case that I'm not able to, to do something. Like right now I'm on duty to designate someone to review it. Um, that doesn't have to be there. It just makes it so that if you don't have a town administrator, things continue to function. It could also be the board of selectmen. Or... That's what I was getting at. I think uh, it could be all three, right? The town administrator or the town administrator's um, designee or the board of selectmen. I think just having that, you know, so it's got some specifics in it as well. But I can't just, I can't just bless a designee. It would have to be approved designee. So it just gives you more flexibility within the law. Yeah. Okay. Well, can we? Um, well, I mean, we should probably deal with this if we, if we, unless you know, we're in discussion here uh, because of the, um, you know, importance of what has just happened um, in town or just been found to have happened in town and. Uh, do you want to reword that now and, and we can look at it again and see if that's something we can we can discuss and decide to um, approve? I'd like to ask a question if I could. Of course. Ryan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Question I'd like to ask, and it certainly became evident with everything regarding to Officer Chatney is as you're ex expressing these these things now to add to the uh, conflict of incident of interest policy, one thing that became very evident is being a small town and it was brought out as we were going over so much, it has been the occasion many times in various departments that work that needs to have been done is they've themselves have handled it just as a matter of factly, just because we are a small town, is this going to mean that in similar situations, no matter what the repair job might be, that they're going to have to come before us or become come before you or, or whatever before they can even like two firemen working together, etc., or whatever? Yes, that that's what it would mean, um, and it's a. It, it's a pretty significant reaction um, to the policy, but the problem with the conflict of interest law is that it's designed to, in, to keep public trust into government. So if, if this is what the town needs in order to, to make sure that it has trust in its government, and I would like to reiterate that this was four years ago, and we've put strong safeguards in place since, and um, to our knowledge have not had any other violations and continue to strive every day to increase transparency and public trust and that our employees now are in no way violating the conflict of interest law or looking to. Um, there will always be a segment of the public that, you know, wants to make sure that we are, we are guarded and, and watched in this way. And, and I don't necessarily blame them. Government has a lot of power and it, it should be watched and policies like this can, can help you. It's just another, another level of checks and balances. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay, so Ryan's made some changes there. I don't know if everyone had a chance to take a look at that, but if, um, if we no, wanted- I can't see it. Okay. Can you see that now, Chris? Um, no, I still can't see it because it's so small. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Well, you may have to, that might be part of the screen. Oh. Well, I'll make the motion to uh, accept the addendum to the conflict of interest policy as presented. I'll second that. Okay, um, seconded. Um, we are in discussion and I'm just gonna read it. Employees must not within the limits of the law enter into a contract with another town of Hubbardston employee or supervisor 
without disclosing the contract to the select board, the town administrator, or the town administrator's designee. So we are still in discussion. Does there anybody else have anything for discussion? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Roll call, Dan, yes. Uh, Katie? Yes. Chris? Yes, yes. Pat? Yes. And Jeff? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Okay, um, so we are on to item eight, uh, which is appointments and resignations. Um, we've got a few of them. Um, Ryan, we've already talked about a couple of these as well, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know how much detail we have to go in here, but I'll just read them first off. So we have uh, Officer Jeffrey White, who is uh, resigning for the Northboro uh, Police Department. Part-time officer Andrew DiPietro, um, who is resigning to go to the Rutland Police Department. We already talked about the CPC member, Barbara Carpenter, resigning. And then we have an appointment of part-time officer, join, uh, the name is John or join? John. John, um, I thought so, but uh, Sturgis. And then we had uh, uh, Sturgis and then Dol Dolores Ordway for the CPC appointment, which we've already done. So. Uh, I guess we can just go one at a time down here, guys, and, and um, go through them. I'd like to uh, make a motion to accept the resignation of Jeffrey White from the police department. I'll second that. Any discussion? I have, yeah, I have a question in terms of where does this leave us in terms of the police department now? Are we shorthanded? Uh, yes, we are. So just to briefly summarize where we are with the police department, uh, we accepted the resignation of Detective Chatney um, in, in, in an unrelated way, which I think is important to say, Officer White resigns. Um, he got a position at the Northboro Police Department. He cited um, that he enjoyed his time here, but he was looking for a bigger department, and Northboro cer certainly offers that. And uh, part-time officer Andrew DiPietro was he has resigned and is looking to look at the Rutland Police Department in a full-time way. Um, we did not have a position full-time before this and uh, they unfortunately got to him first. However, we are looking to um, appoint part-time officer John Sturgis who's, who's applied previously and um, you know could be a potential candidate for a full-time police officer. We've also advertised for police department full-time police officer when we received the resignation of Jeffrey White. So we're confident we can fill that position soon, uh, which would leave us a little shorthanded, but not, not as shorthanded as it sounds. Okay, any further discussion? Nope, seeing none, we'll go to a vote, roll call. Uh, Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Um, Chris? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Okay, so the next one is part-time officer Andrew DiPietro. I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Andrew DiPietro. I'll the second it. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> uh, seconded by, by Jeff. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. now, seeing none, we'll vote. Uh, roll call, Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Chris? Yes. Matt? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Next is CPC member Barbara Carpenter. I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Barbara Carpenter from CPC. I'll second that. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Uh, roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. yes. Chris? Yes. Matt? Yes. And Jeff? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. And one more is part-time officer John Sturgis. I'll Point. make a motion to appoint uh, part-time officer John Sturgis. I'll second it. Seconded by Katie. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Chris? Yes. Pat? Yes. And Jeff? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Um, so that completes that work. Item nine is wage authorizations. Uh, so this is in line with that. So this would be uh, for part-time officer John Sturgis. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the wage authorization for part-time officer John Sturgis. 
I'll second it. Seconded by Katie. Uh, any discussion? None will vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Chris? Yes. Pat? Yes. And Jeff? Yes. Sounds good. Um, next item is our January 4th meeting minutes. Uh, Ryan, you mind popping those up if you've got them handy for us? Okay, sounds good. We got everybody there except for Pat. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of the select board meeting on what was the date? I can't see it here. January 4th. Of the January 4th meeting. I'll second that. Okay, uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yeah. Chris? Yes. Pat? Yes. Abstain. And Jeff? Yes. Okay, uh, four yeses and one abstention from Pat. Sounds good. Uh, up to the next item, which is 11 uh, committee updates. I do not have any. Katie, you got any or anybody else? Um, EDC was pretty much uh, talked about um, doing the, um, getting that, um, oh, what is the word for it? Well, we already just approved. I can't even remember. Um, Ryan, help me out. No, don't help her. Don't help her. Just DLTA. <laughs> Thank you. Don't don't leave me out there to hang. For the love of God. Um, yeah, we pretty much talked about that, and we, you know, a few other things. We're still looking for a couple new committee members, but yeah, it was it was a good meeting. Um, we're working on it, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, item twelve is matters not reasonably anticipated. That chair. I don't have any. Does anyone have anything they want to uh, bring up? I'd like to ask a question. Where uh, do we stand, uh, Ryan, in regards to uh, a secretary for the uh, select board replacing Bobby? So we had a couple strong candidates that we interviewed last week, and we have offered the position to a very strong and experienced executive assistant. Uh, we're just not ready to make that public yet until everything is signed. All right, thank you. But we will have someone in place who, um, who the entire team believes is a, is a great fit. And um, I think you'll see the qualifications are very strong. Okay, anyone uh, have anything else? Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about this elevator in the center school. Um, where is it? Where is this elevator? I haven't had a chance to review it. Um, I had a Zoom call with the superintendent and the business or the operations director and the facilities director. Oh man, we lost lights. It's so the, oh. hold on, I'm just gonna stand up. All right, well, he does that. It's right when you walk in, if you're heading towards where you have to check in uh, behind the glass, um, if you, right on the right side, right there, um, on the, the regular um, base floor um, is where the elevator is. So it's right there, right when you walk in on your right side. Yeah, it's in the main lobby. Yeah. And does this elevator have to be inspected annually, like most elevators do? Yes. And we got an estimate of is seventy thousand dollars to replace it or to repair it? Repair it. Oh, a new elevator would be like a million bucks. Elevators are incredibly expensive. So yeah, I was wondering about who they talked to about repairs, but yeah, that's definitely a repair number. This this hasn't been procured. They were just trying to, to see what the emergency cost would be. So the, the actual estimate they got was $50,000 for the, for the piece and the repair and the installation. And then there's electrical and, and other things that need to go into it as well. So this is something that wouldn't have been caught in an annual inspection. It's something that just let go all of a sudden. As far as I understand, um, and I can get more information on that for you, just trying to present to the board what happened and what we might need to do. Um, because without the elevator, you know, there's certain restrictions for students, et cetera, so. Yeah, sure. And what's the threshold, Ryan, again, I. I um... I should know, but is it everything over 10,000 is our responsibility and below that is the schools? Yes. Okay, so clear. I mean, I know it's way over, but just, just to sort of 
state that you know when little things happen but when bigger things happen they're ours okay not good um, news no not good news um anyone have anything else uh nope okay so any public or press question and answer um i know we still have two attendees we have somebody with their hand up ryan yeah that's mr blanchard okay i think we're at the point now where we can um we can um uh, make yet a, uh, a panelist again and, and see what he's got to say. Yes, I'm, I'm here again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, be because the uh, board had discussion on getting all of the uh, uh, state ethics board testimony so that they could review that. I, I, I would like to ask the select board to make that a motion. So it's into the minutes that uh, that we'd make every effort to uh, get that testimony and, and have it reviewed by the select board. Okay, so this is what um, Ed's asking for. If, if somebody wishes to make a motion, please do. Uh, I'll make the motion that we uh, try to get the depositions from the ethics commission on their um, hearing, I guess, or investigation. I'll second that. Okay, uh, that's seconded. Any discussion? Well, we a motion about something that we don't know if we can, in fact, have access to those. Shouldn't we find out first what we are able to access and then move on that? Well, we, we can... I mean, we're in discussion here. We, we can still ask. You can make a motion for us to ask. And I think that's what we're doing now. So um, if that turned out, you know, we don't know what the result of that's going to be. Uh, for some reason, if that was confidential beyond what, what our request was going to be, then that's what we would report back with. But I, I think that the motion, as, as stated, seems like it's got, um, you know, full on merit to me. All right. Okay. Any further discussion? I don't even know what that was in the background. <laughs> Must be. But, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, we'll go to a vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Um, all right, Ed. Um, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Good night. Sounds good. Have a good night. Thanks for hanging in. Okay, um, so it's not over. Um, so public press question and answer, anything else? Any other hands up or anything? I know we've got Bella on there, but that is for, I suspect, executive session. Um, do you know otherwise, um, Ryan? I believe that's it. All right, so we will, um, we will next be heading to executive session without the uh, intention of returning to open session. So does somebody wanna start that off for us? I'll make the motion to adjourn from the open session meeting and move into executive session under general law chapter 39 paragraph 23b2 to consider the discipline or dismissal of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual Bella Caldera constable with no intent after of coming back into open session. I'll second that. Okay, seconded by Pat. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Roll call. Dan, yes. Katie? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jeff? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Okay, uh, we're now entering into executive session.